kind of quaking in their boots that Sonal's not going to be here uh, in the coming semester. Um, so today she's going to give us her finishing seminar. Thanks, Sonal. Thanks, Jim, for that very generous introduction. It's really an honor to get to be able to address you all, um, having sat in that seat for so many, for so many, for so many Wednesdays. It's just, it's really fun to be up here. And today I'm going to be telling you about my dissertation research, um, which is entitled A Fine Scale Analysis of a Tropical Suture Zone. So I'm going to, would somebody lights. mind taking the setting lights? I'm going to actually start with this figure that Dave Wake showed me uh, a couple of months ago from a centennial celebration of the publishing of The Origin of Species. And it's a figure drawn by in, um, an article by Dobjansky in which he shows the process of lineage formation as a continuous process. So you can imagine you start at this point A and you have you know, this population and over time things, you know, when you just start to diverge and point B, you know, they're kind of different but they're not quite there. And then you get to point C and these things are now distinct and then it starts again. And it's this iterative process that I think is really fascinating. And the question which motivates me in my research is what are the factors that predict this progress of divergence? Now to study to study this question, I have two main foci I'll be telling you about. The first is cryptic species, and the second is um, I use suture zones. So first to introduce cryptic species. Cryptic species are lineages that have been lineages that have been defined largely based on genetic data in which they don't show marked morphological differentiation. And this is from a review in 2007 by Bickford et al., where they showed um, an increase in the number of cryptic and sibling species defined through time. And what you can see, I think, is the, you know, this is starting to become a really, I'm sorry, and what's on the y-axis is the percent of papers published in um, Bioasis in which the lineages described are sibling or cryptic species. And I think what you can see is that, especially as we started to apply genetic tools to species, a lot of lineages that we're defining are, in fact, cryptic. And so one of the questions that is interesting to me is how do we determine if cryptic species are real? So are these just genetic lineages that are blinking in and out of time, or is there something um, concrete about them that we can, it's worth you know, giving them a name? And this is from a paper by Lachey and Fujita out of the MBZ, published in 2011, where they used um, Bayesian species delimitation to define within a widespread morpho species, um, the gecko, Amidaculus, um, they were able to define a few new species. And these, all these lineages were morphologically cryptic. They had marked genetic differentiation. And for the most part, the only thing that defined them was that they were in different geographic localities. So are these, you know, and there's obviously a lot of use in defining, there can be use in defining new units. But one of the questions which, in which I'm interested is, like, are those units actually real in any way? And one of the great ways to study cryptic um, lineages is through suture zones. So suture zones are geographically located narrow, sorry, geographically restricted regions in which there are multiple overlapping contact zones. And they were first described um, by Remington in 1968, and they formed due to shared biogeographic history. And the reason they're so great, for particularly for the study of cryptic species, is a lot of cryptic species are phylogeographic lineages which are formed due to some kind of shared biogeographic history. And so you can get clustering of, you often get clustering of contact zones between cryptic lineages. And so in this um, paper, a meta-analysis by Swenson et al., they showed um, concentration of contact zones throughout the United States. And you can see there's like a real concentration of contact zones through the Rockies, for example, um, which is a very dynamic region. And so suture zones, I think, can be a powerful way to understand speciation because they give us a chance to look at what is happening between lineages that have been previously isolated <coughs> that are coming back into secondary contact. And um, there's a lot of differing historical opinions on the value of looking at hybrid zones and suture zones. Um, I love this quote from Ronald Fisher, which I think um, somebody earlier in MV's lunch this semester used, that the grossest blunder and sexual preference, which we can conceive of an animal making, would be making the species different from its own. So there's a lot of people who said that hybrid zones are just failed speciation events, there's really no reason to study them, so just, you know, don't waste your time. But I think the view, of course, I have, because I just spent the last six years doing this, is that hybrid zones can teach us something about speciation. And I wouldn't be somebody who studies hybrid zones if I don't quote Rich Harrison um, and say that hybrid zones are a possible window into speciation. So 
And also, and not just can they teach us about sense speciation, it's also possible that hybrid zones can be a source of evolutionary novelty, whether that's through adaptive integration or hybrid speciation or reinforcement. So the study in which I do, the system in which I do this work is Australian wet tropics, which some of you might be familiar with because this is where Craig has done a lot of his work over the last 20 years. And it's a narrow strip of rainforest in um, northeast Queensland, right over here. And it's just, it's a very small portion of Australia's land mass. And I think it's because it's so geographically restricted that I was able to do the work I'm going to be sharing with you today. So the Australian wet tropics, which I'm going to um, um, short to AWT, is characterized by this very dynamic history. And in this paper by Graham et al. in 2006, they used Poland core data to reconstruct the rainforest through time. And what you can see is that the rainforest, through these repeated glacial cycles of the last like 10 million years, continuously, it's, it's currently pretty continuous, but in the past, during the glacial cycles, the rainforest broke into two major refugia, one in the north and one in the south. And this is what you're seeing here. And so what happened during that time is the rainforest retracted to, the, retracted to these two major refugia, and the animals and plants, which are restricted to the rainforest, also retracted to these two refugia, and you have a population in the north and a population in the south. And they remain isolated from each other for long periods of time. And what that led to is these periods of long isolation led to deep genetic divergences within rainforest taxa. So here is just a smattering of reptiles and frogs that live in the wet tropics. Um, this is comparative phylogeography work done by Schneider and Bell et al. And what you can see, these are all phylo lineages within a species. And in each of these, in each of these networks, there's um, a population in the north here, which is in black, and a population in the south, which here is shown in white, and there's quite a big genetic break between them. And so you can see this for pretty much every single taxa that's been studied in the wet tropics, you can see this break. And when Bell et al. went back and looked at some of these same contacts with nuclear data, which you can see in these networks down here, they confirmed these results. And so in the, since the last glacial maximum, about three to 8,000 um, years ago, um, expansion out of these refugia led to suture zones. So we have this northern refugia and the southern refugia, the populations expanded out of the north and the south, and they met in this spatially clustered <coughs> hybrid zone, contact zones. And so this suture zone consists of at least 20 lineage pairs meeting in secondary contact. Um, in the figure on the left, each of these red lines represents one of these zones of secondary contact. So all, each one of those red lines represents a contact zone between lineages within a morpho species. <coughs> and there's great taxonomic breadth in the contact zones that we see. You can see some in <coughs> lizards, some in frogs, marsupials, and there's even some work um, done by others in plants where plants also show the same break. One of the cool things about this suture zone is that the genetic divergence between the lineage pairs varies a lot. So this is just mitochondrial genetic distance between the lineage pairs that meet in the contact zone. And you can see the range in genetic distance is anywhere from about 1.1% to about 18%. So it's a, it's a big range. But what's surprising is that despite some of these lineages being quite divergent from each other, they tend to be, there tends to be almost no morphological divergence. So there's a lot of data on this slide, but the main take home point, these are the three lizards uh, species I focus on. I'll be telling you more about them later. And then these are the different lineages of which I study. The main take home point though is that these are just PCs um, summarizing the amount of variation across the lineages, is that there's very few red stars because there's almost no morphological variation among lineages within a species. And when there is morphological variation, it's like small in a biological sense, right? It's like a couple millimeters in head lump. So th they're actually quite cryptic. And when you have them in the field, you can't tell them apart, which made it, as you can imagine, quite challenging to actually identify the contact zones. Um, a question I always get is, well, surely there's some kind of environmental gradient that's setting up these hybrid zones. A lot of, <coughs> a lot of contact zones in nature occur on an environmental gradient. And there is an environmental gradient. Um, this is some <coughs> bioclim data summarized as PCs. Um, 
the x-axis is PC1, the y-axis is PC2. The blue dots are from um, points sampled from the northern refugia. The green dots are points sampled from the southern refugia. And the orange dots are from the ecotone, or the location of the suture zone. And there is... There is an environmental gradient, but it's quite broad and quite, um, like it's not, there's no absolute um, ecotone. And so, given all that, I think this is an excellent system for comparative analyses of diversification. And in my thesis, I focused on these lineages here within uh, three species complexes. Carla Rupert, you know, like after six years, you think I'll be able to pronounce it. Carlia <laughs> Rupert. <laughs> I'm not going to even try it. The red throated skink Carlia, um, Lamperfolus cagueri, and Saprosynchus lewisi, and Saprosynchus basiliscus. Um, this is an ultrametric tree, so it gives you kind of an idea of the different levels of genetic divergence among these lineages. Um, they're all closely related and ecologically similar. They're small brown forest leaf litter for rainforest skinks. Um, and so I think it's because of their, you know, ecological similarities and where they're clo and they're closely related that allows this to be a nice comparative system. And just to show you where you where they are on the map, they're here on the map. And so these are the four main questions I'm addressing in my work. I'm going to go through each one as each one separately, and I really invite you to stop and ask me questions at the end of each one, because um, they kind of build on each other. So the first question which I'm interested, was interested in asking, was to look at the patterns of hybridization across the suture zone. So for this work, I focused on the five contact zones where we were actually able to find a geographic locality where the two lineages were meeting. And what's great about this is we can look at what's going on when these lineages meet, given that they have um, differing levels of genetic divergence. And, um, and so the question that I'm trying to answer, understand here is how do populations become species? Um, I'm just going to actually focus on this, this classic data set from Koinonor, um, published in 1997 from Drosophila, where they look at the extent of post-zygotic isolation as a function of genetic distance between lineage pairs. And you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, that as genetic distance increases, you get more reproductive isolation. And I think in some ways this is kind of, like, it seems like an obvious result. Well, obviously as things get more different, they become more isolated from each other. But I think it's important to note that until Coin and Orr showed this, um, this result was, showed it in this paper, this, we, we had that intuition, but it wasn't quite clear. And so, um, I'm addressing two questions with this. The first is, are these lineages just evolutionary ephemera? So the lineages that we're ident identifying that, you know, we, are they just going to blink in and out? Like, or are they actually going to last? So um, I think this, is, this question's become a little bit more clear when you see the data. And the second question is I was interested in how much, how the reproductive isolation between these sister lineages um, accumulates as a function of divergence time. So the hypothesis that is as divergence time between the sister lineages increases, we should see more reproductive isolation. And again, I'm the first to admit that this is kind of like not, it's not a very complicated hypothesis. Of course, as divergence time increases, you'd expect more isolation. I think the question, one of the questions I had is really what is the strength and form of that relationship as well. But if this is true, these are the predictions we might make. Um, Klein width should decrease. Clients should become more concordant, or they should have more similar widths. The proportion of the hybrids in the hybrid zone should decrease. And disequilibrium, both uh, measured as between locus and within locus, um, should increase. And so the basic approach we used with this work is we first identified populations represented here and here that were geogra geographically far from the contact zone. And the reason we wanted to make sure they were geographically far from the contact zone is we didn't want to have any sample any populations that contained recent intergression. And so we used those data from those populations, we collected transcriptome data, to both infer <coughs> demography and develop markers. Then using those markers, we collected dense samplings of populations through each contact zone, and we genotyped them at 10 nuclear loci and 1 mitochondrial loci 
and we use those data to infer the extent of reproductive isolation. I'm just going to jump right into the data. The first important step was to kind of to provide a context for all this work is we wanted to understand the divergence history of these lineages. Um, and I did this using a program called DADI, which is very similar to IM in its and what it's trying to do, but it uses a much different kind of data. It uses a site frequency spectrum. Um, I can, I'm happy to talk about the methods later. I purposely left a lot of the methods out, just as a point, because a lot of this stuff has been published or is in press, so like we can talk about it after if you guys are more interested. Um, and I'm also going to introduce now a convention that I'm going to use for the rest of the talk, which is I always am ordering lineage pairs in order of least divergent to most divergent from left to right or when I put them top to bottom, least divergent to most divergent, just to kind of, um, so you guys can frame yourself. But I think there's two main points I wanted you guys to take away from these data showing the divergence times. The first is that the range of divergence times is about 3.1 million years to about 11.5 million years ago, which means the divergence time among the lineage pairs varies about 3.7 fold, which really makes it a nice system where we can sample and look at what's going on you know, throughout the divergence process. The other important take home point here is that M, or the effective number of migrants, is very low in this system. Um, here, M is below, well below one, which means there was very little migration between these lineages as they diverge, which makes life a little bit easier for some of the analyses. So these are um, structure plots for each one of the contact zones. For those of you who aren't familiar with these, each bar here represents one individual, and the proportion that's orange versus blue represents how much of its genome comes from one parental lineage versus the other parental lineage. And the bulk of the width is the nuclear DNA um, results, and the smaller bar for each is the mitochondrial DNA. And again, as I've said, I've arrayed these from least divergent lineage pair to most divergent lineage pair. And we got, we were, one of the reasons why it's very convenient to study these lizards is that they're super dense, and even me as a somewhat subpar lizard catcher <laughs> was able to get really decent sampling, um, which was really useful to be able to power these analyses. And so I think this slide represents over um, a thousand lizards, which is pretty cool. I sent it to my mom and she was like, this is what you've been doing? So, but anyways, the main point to take from this, I think in general, you can see that as we get step from less divergent, divergent lineage pairs to more divergent lineage pairs, um, integration extent decreases, such to the point that we get to this lineage pair, and there's no obvious evidence for hybridization. So, for the divergence yeah. times, have you made a, is there some sort of correction for um, coalescence time? What is that, what is that, when you say divergence time, what does that mean? So divergent, it's the coalescent-based approach, so it accounts for that, and it's, in this case, I'm using um, a molecular clock, I'm assuming a molecular clock, so. So, so, you, so you think it actually is the time at which the populations were physically separated from each other for the first so, okay. time? Okay, so that's a good question, because right, because these guys have a really complex history where they probably came into contact in the past and had gene flow then, and the model I fit to the model I use to fit to the lineage pairs is much simpler than what they probably actually experienced. So yeah, it's a, it's a good point. One thing that makes me, that might make this a little bit simpler to think about and is that my results are robust whether I use divergence time or nuclear divergence. So if I just use an absolute estimate of nuclear divergence, th these results stay the same. And in fact, nuclear divergence and divergence time are highly correlated in the system. Yeah, I'm just I'm a little bit surprised they're so deep because obviously those are way, way older than the last place on maximum, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are millions of years as opposed to ten, a few tens of thousands of years. So yeah, they much predate though. But I think the idea is that you know what's going on in the last glacial maximum all that predates has been continued from I mean, in order a million yeah. years or longer. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Um, and I would love to think about uh, fitting more complicated models that might actually account for some of that, the complexity in the geography. Um, sorry, so again, and then just to looking at those data in a different way, we were able to fit climbs um, through each contact zone. And um, I'm sorry, we weren't able to fit climbs. We didn't fit climbs through this contact zone because obviously there was no hybridization um, and the sampling wasn't quite there. And in each one of these plots, the orange line re re represents mitochondrial DNA, and the blue represents the hybrid index, which is kind of the composite measure of um, the genetic identity of these samples. And I think it's really clear here that you can start to see that as you become 
get more and more divergent, the clients sharply narrow. And um, an easier way, perhaps, to look at all these data is just to take point estimates of different indices of reproductive isolation for each lineage pair and correlate that with splitting time or divergence time. And so the measures I used here are average client width um, for the nuclear genes, <coughs> the mitochondrial DNA client width, um, the variance in client width, FIS, which is a measure of Hardy-Weinberg <coughs> disequilibrium, RIJ, which is a measure of linkage, linkage disequilibrium, and the percent of hybrids. And um, I got, I think for me this was really surprising how clean these results were, because I expected, like I said, I expected there to be a strong pattern, it's kind of an obvious hypothesis, but I didn't expect them to be this clean. Like, I don't know if it's biologically possible to get correlations of 0 0.999, <laughs> but I did, so that's great. Um, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, but I think what I think the reason these patterns are so clean is, I think what we're seeing here is the fact that, the, I think what we're seeing is that divergence in these lineages is largely driven by history, and there's definitely you know there's a shared ecology here, and I think a lot of um, a lot of the variation in other studies similar to this one are dealing with systems that are much more ecologically disparate, where different lineages have different ecologies, and they're also you know, experiencing different selection histories, where as the lineages I'm studying, we're subject to the same ecology and the same history. Or, I shouldn't say the same, similar. So, from this work, we have, um, you know, results support our predictions that increased divergence time leads to increased reproductive isolation. And I think more importantly, though, it shows that for some of these lineages, like these two here in particular, and these, I mean, these three in particular, that we can see, you know, marked reproductive isolation. You know, strong disequilibrium, strong, um, you know, very few hybrids, very narrow finds. Even though, you know, even though these lineages are cryptic, and so phylogeographic structure is, you know, an important component of um, biodiversity. And I think these results help support that claim. Um, before I jump into the next thing, are there any questions? But do you think also that, that the fact that they're so closely related to each other means that their mechanisms of reproductive isolation might be similar? And, and if they all have a, like a, some kind of linear relationship with time, then that might be another reason why you find such consistent results. Yeah, that's, a, that's a cool question. So yeah, because especially because they're morphologically cryptic, if they're like, so let's think about like pre-zygotic cues, that if they're, since they're morphologically cryptic, if they're cueing on something, maybe it's probably and they're also fossorial, so they, you know, they don't spend a lot of time looking at each other. Um, <laughs> they, they're probably cueing on something orderant-based, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's shared or... Um, and I also think, I mean, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I think post-zygotic mechanisms are probably really important in the system. Yeah, Ellen? I had a question on those graphs that you just showed. Yeah. So is it the same data set used to calculate the splitting time as the, as the parameter on the y-axis? That's a great question, and no. So the the data on the x-axis are calculated go back, from these populations here. So the x-axis is driven by these data, and the y-axis um, is data from these populations. Thanks. Yes. This may be the wrong place to ask the question you entered in, but they're they're cryptic <coughs> to us because we're visually oriented. Yeah. But what, what about olfactory and that sort of stuff, which may not be cryptic at all? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And so I did made choice trials, which were intended to get at that, but I have 600 hours of videos of lizards just sitting in a box doing nothing, unfortunately. <laughs> so I'm going to analyze those eventually. I, I, think there's, I think we can pull something out of that. And the behavioral people on campus keep on motivating me to do that. Um, but, and I'm also starting a collaboration with Maria Tonioni and Craig, where we're doing a little bit of pilot study on where we took pheromone swabs and to look at whether or not they've diverged at all in those profiles. So I definitely think you're right. So I think one of the, one of the things that this kind of work maybe could help motivate is starting to look at some more cryptic phenotypes and understanding how they might contribute to speciation. Um, all right, so one of the questions which followed from that is what led to divergence in this, these lineages? And this is work um, that I published with Craig in Molecular Ecology. And in this, I'm actually focusing on the anomaly in the system, which is um, a contact zone, I'm sorry, it's not really a contact zone, but 
interactions between these two lineages within Saprocincus basiliscus, the central and southern lineage. So again, it's coming back to the same question. Why do some genetic lineages diverge into proper species, proper in quotation marks, because I've spent enough time talking to Dave Wake and Jim Patton, and why do some just are evolutionary ephemera lost to extinction and hybridization? And um, I think one of the things that we hypothesize is that long-term geographic stability is key. So in this complex, here of Saprocincus basiliscus, there's four main mitochondrial lineages. So it's these four here. There's the northern lineage, the central lineage, Lewis I, <coughs> and the southern lineage. And one of the main things to take from this um, gene tree is that the southern lineage and Lewis I are quite divergent from the rest of the clay, and they're about 15 to 18 percent <coughs> mitochondrially divergent from the rest of the clay. Now, if you look at the nuclear data, these are nuclear data summarized um, using a POFAD analysis. You can see that Lewis I are quite distinct from the rest of the group, but the southern lineage, which is also you know, quite distinct at the new, uh, mitochondrial locus, shows none of that same distinction, right? It's kind of clustered in with the rest of the guys. And if you look at that um, by, I think an easier way to summarize those results is if you <coughs> plot the extent of mitochondrial DNA, DNA divergence against nuclear divergence for the lineage pairs in this group, most, most of the points kind of follow this pretty nice correlation where you, know, you get decent amount of mitochondrial divergence and you get you know, corresponding nuclear divergence. The one exception is this point here, which is between those two lineages, between the central and southern lineage. And so the question became, why are they so divergent at the mitochondrial but not at all divergent, hardly divergent at all at the nuclear genome. And so there's a couple things that could cause this kind of discordance. You could just have mutational variants, so maybe there's just differences at the rate of which mutations are occurring. You could just have variants in the coalescent process, or you could have intergression. Um, again, I'm going to skip over the methods because it's a bit tedious, but we use approximate Bayesian computi computation to test these different hypotheses and found that intergression was the most likely. I just want to point out that this type of discordance where different genes tell you different stories is really common in the natural world. This was from a review by Toes and Bresfold published in 2012 where they just showed how many papers show this pattern. And you can see at this point there's almost 120 papers um, which show discordance and I suspect that's only going to increase as more people collect nuclear data. But in the wet tropics, this isn't a pattern we see, right? For the most part, if you go back, if we go back to this, you know, our, we don't see that much discordance. The nuclear genes and the mitochondrial tends to tell us the same story. You know, this is really the exception. So in wet tropics, this kind of pattern isn't that common. And in fact, the only other case of discordance in the wet tropics is found um, from the same region in which those lineages occur, and it's in the frog Latoria nonotis. And so this was published um, by Bell et al. And you can see they also have this really divergent mitochondrial lineage, which occurs in the south, but isn't at all divergent at the nuclear genome, which is reflected here. So both cases of discordance in the wet tropics occurs in the same geographic region in two very different species, which made us think that perhaps it's got something to do with the geography of that region. And if you look at the paleo models for that region, this part of the wet tropics is particularly unstable, right? So during the last glacial maximum, there's predicted to have been very little um, rainforest in that region. Um, and so unlike right, the core refugia year and year. And so perhaps um, it's that instability that leads to genetic lineages that are just ephemera. And the stable regions of the wet tropics, like the core, like the northern and southern refugia that were um, stable through time, is promotes cryptic diversity of the type that we are recovering. Um, so are there any questions on this part before I jump into the... So this kind of gets at um, the question Dale, Dale proposed, which is what maintains divergence in these lineages? So, I mean, it's all well and good that these guys are reproductively isolated from each other, but obviously it would be great to have an idea about the mechanisms. And so to do that, we did a little bit more fine-scale analysis of one contact zone 
which is between Lamprophilus cagrii central and Lamprophilus cagrii southern. And this work was published with Craig um, in 2012 in Evolution. And some um, possible hypotheses that could explain, I just want to remind you what the patterns are in this context zone. Let me just actually do it this way. So this context, no, it's not a good way. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so just to remind you, this is the context zone we're studying here more in depth. So it's this context zone where the clines are very, very narrow. So what are the patterns that could explain those narrow clines? Um, some possible hypotheses, none of which are mutually exclusive, are uh, recency of contact. So maybe these lineages just came and met each other yesterday, and that's, there just hasn't been enough time for hybridization and aggression for the clients to get wide. Another is that maybe there's an environmental gradient. There's a lot of great systems, um, like Paul's work, where you know, there's an environmental gradient that's helped structuring the narrowness of hybridization clients. Um, maybe there's a sort of mating. So maybe these guys are able to distinguish each other, they're not mating that often, and that's leading to narrow clines. Um, another possible is selection against hybrids. Here, um, I said intrinsic, but it need not be intrinsic. Should have. Selection against hybrids, let's keep that more general. And so this hybrid zone has two points of contact, which is pretty convenient. The first is here along a highway. And let me tell you, you haven't lived until you've sampled on a highway. I got hit with a rum and coke can, and that was, I was like, done. <laughs> and then um, they also meet around this lake, which is, um, it's about five kilometers around the entire lake. And in both cases, we were able to sample decent population sizes. And at both places, we recovered the same patterns, which are, Limited intergression, so we see very, like, very, very limited intergression. Very narrow clines that are coincident, um, which means that they're geographically co-localized, and we see strong disequilibrium. So, I just, just to kind of emphasize how narrow these are, um, you can start at point A, and it's pure, it's pure of one type, and then you move 300 meters, and it's pure of the other type. So it's about a 300 meter transition in genotype. Um, and of course, this is all dependent on how the organism sees space. So the dispersal length in these lizards is about 80 meters a generation. So they're seeing, you know, they're moving around enough that, you know, it's not just because these guys are born and never move. So, um, so to revisit the hypotheses, like what could explain this pattern, right? So we, we have these patterns. Which of these hypotheses could explain it? So the first was recency of contact. So using the data we found, um, we estimated that the lizards would have had to come into contact uh, five years ago in order for the clients to be this narrow. So, like, I don't, it's possible, but Craig's been working in this system for 20 years, so, like, we're thinking that maybe that's not the case. <laughs> the second is an environmental gradient. Um, like I pointed out, there is an environmental gradient in this system, but it's much wider than the nature of the hybrid zone itself, right? So the gradient is, like, 20 kilometers big, and our gradient is only, uh, I'm sorry, our clines are only 300 meters. So there's a discrepancy in scale there. Environmental gradients of that width can still drive narrow zones if there's a density um, trough. Um, as far as we can tell, there's no obvious breaks in density. So it's possible, but there's, it, this seems unlikely because, in fact, the lizards are dense throughout the contact zone. So the, um, it doesn't seem like a likely explanation. There could be assorted of mating, which is why I have those 600 hours of lizard videos, um, which to help, would help test that. Um, I'm going to get a little bit, but I also did some simulations to look at the effect of assorted mating on hybrid zone width. And one of the interesting things I found is if you have like a simple model for assorted of mating where there's one gene that sets the male preference and one gene that sets the, uh, sorry, if you have one gene that sets the male trait and one gene that sets the female preference, then a sort of mating can do a great job in maintaining narrow clines. But if you have a complicated genetic architecture where there's multiple genes influencing the male trait and perhaps multiple genes influencing the female preference, a sort of mating actually doesn't do that good of a job of maintaining clines. So um, I can talk more about that later, but that made us a little bit more skeptical about a sort of mating. It obviously could have a role, but it might be um, limited. So that kind of left us with selection against hybrids. So we started to think that there must be really strong against selection against hybrids, which is keeping these lineages um, genetically distinct even when they meet. And 
using our data, we were able to estimate that the average selection on a locus was about 40%, suggesting that like there's a 40% differential in selection strength between heterozygotes versus um, non <coughs> hybrids and non-hybrids. And one thing that was weird though, like even if you have really strong selection, and you would expect that some loci should kind of break free of that selection and start to show really wide widths. So right, so here one of the things we see is that every single locus um, shows exact, very similar patterns. None of them are that different from one another. Um, if, even if selection is really strong, some loci, you know, are going to be neutral. They're not, are, and they're not going to be linked to anything under selection. And eventually, they'll break free through recombination, and they'll start to flatten out and diffuse neutrally. And we don't see that pattern here. And so we did some simulations, and this, the main figure to look at here is width, and these are with different selection strengths. And what you can see is that if so unless selection is really strong, the width of um, a climb starts to increase very quickly through time, right? Again, because of this neutral process. And so in order to maintain really narrow climbs at a locus, if it's not under selection, total selection on the organism has to be really strong. So these results made us think that total selection on the hybrids, on the hybrids in the system must be really strong. Um, obviously, the ideal thing to do would be to take these lizards into the lab and start making Lab, laboratory uh, hybrids and start to look and see, you know, maybe they're missing an eye or um, have an extra limb. And my colleague Ben Phillips is actually doing that now. So hopefully we'll be able to put some, um, you know, natural based data with these genetic ideas. So, um, so thinking about what's maintaining divergence in these lineages. We think selection against hybrids, um, probably in the form of incompatibilities, like dobjansky muller incompatibilities, probably are maintaining lineage boundaries in this system. But that being said, I haven't, we haven't ruled out assorted mating yet, particularly because, if you remember, there's one contact zone um, where there's no hybridization at all. And so, you know, maybe they're producing hybrids in that system and they just never live to see the light of day, and that's why we can't, we're not seeing evidence of hybridization but it also seems likely that maybe they're, they figured out um, the organisms, the two lineages ha are able to distinguish between each other. And so um, there might be some assorted mating going on there. Yeah, so I'm not sure. So partially because we could, and partially because we thought it would be interesting, is we decided to take a genomic scale um, perspective on interaction. And so for this work, um, and this is done in collaboration with KB, um, for this work, we focused on four contact zones, um, which are the four, five of uh, the five contact zones I studied previously. Those, except for this uh, Saprocinctus lewisii basiliscus, because there's no hybridization in that one, so we focused on these four, in which we did see evidence for hybridization. And so again, our predictions that are in the more highly divergent lineage pairs, the extent of integration is going to be more limited than in less divergent lineage pairs. And that this is uh, the prediction that, so we, that's a prediction more about the role of divergence history in influencing integration. But we were also interested in looking at what's going on in the genome. So obviously we're going to get a lot more loci with this study. And we're interested in saying, okay, given integration at a, within a contact zone, there's obviously a range of uh, Klein widths. What are the predictors of that range of Klein widths? Is it just random? or? Does selection history at a locus influence the integration patterns at that locus? So the prediction is that maybe outlier, I'm um, sorry, genes which are, have been under selection throughout the divergence history of these lineages are also going to be outliers in integration extent. And so just to revisit this figure, we use the same data. Um, we use data from these isolated populations to infer selection um, at each locus. And then we used um, the same individuals collected through the contact zone. Um, we pooled the populations and we used exome capture data to infer integration. Um, because I'm not going to get into the methods here, but exome capture data allows you to collect um, a targeted subset of the genome for a huge number of individuals. And so in this case, we targeted uh, about three megs or three, um, three million base pairs of genetic data for each one of these populations. 
so the cool part about that is you get tons of data. So I think um, I have like 50,000 SNPs in each contact zone. So um, more data than really I knew what to do with. So um, variation at the SNPs was characterized into four types. And these are just showing examples of those four types from one of the less divergent lineage pairs and from one of the more divergent lineage pairs. And so we had clines that we called sweep clines because they basically, every single population in the hybrid zone showed about the same allele frequency, even though the isolated populations were distinct. We had clines that were exceptionally narrow, clines that were just seemed kind of neutral, and then clines that were wide. Um, and we actually, for this, to define these, we just used a basic cutoffs, like 5% cutoffs, which isn't that, uh, which isn't that informed, but, so I'd be interested if people have ideas on how to more intelligently define outliers <coughs> and introduction. That'd be great. This work is still ongoing, so it'd be great to talk to you more about that. Um, I think this is one of the main figures from this work where we're looking at um, the distribution of climb widths and climb centers across the contact zones. And this represents about 10,000 climbs for each one of these contacts. And this, this really recapitulates the results I showed you um, at the beginning of my talk, where you can see that with climb width increases in more um, and less divergent lineage pairs, but I think it really just takes home like how pervasive this pattern is and how it's true across the genome. Um, and you can really see like not only is the width exceptionally narrow, but the range of widths is also very narrow. And this inspired um, uh, uh, a little, a little uh, take home that Dave said to me, which is history cleans up messes which I think really is clear, right? So in this less divergent lineage pair, there's tons of mass, there's tons of noise, and as the lineage be pairs become less, more and more divergent, you really start to see the distributions narrow in and close in and become neater. And I like that idea that history is cleaning up messes. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. I want you guys to be able to get to class. Um, I think I have time to show this. Um, what we did here is we looked at so that, sorry, let me back up. This pattern shows patterns of regression across the contacts. Now, we looked at what's going on in a locus by locus basis. So there are four estimates, four metrics we calculated to kind of look at what's going on in a locus by locus basis. We calculated the FST at a given SNP. We calculated the FST at a given locus. We looked at the net divergence at a given locus, and then we calculated um, a commonly used metric of positive selection, DM, DS, also known as omega. And we looked at the correlations between these different metrics and climb width, predicting perhaps that you know we'd see some kind of correlation. The reason there's no R squared values or no P values are because all the R squared values were around zero, and all the P values were correspondingly uh, <coughs> insignificant. So really, we captured there was no real pattern where the selection history at a given locus predicted its um, interaction patterns. So I'm going to, again, skip this in the interest of time. Um, and so in this system, demography seems to predict interaction patterns much more than the selection history of a locus. And I think the main point to um, take home from this is that messy patterns across the genome tidy up over time. So to conclude my entire talk and my work is that I think cryptic species are a real thing. Um, and I think there's a couple things that are interesting to think about if that's true. One is it begs us to look at divergence in cryptic phenotypes. So whether that's looking at things like chemosensory um, or physiology or perhaps life cycle, perhaps you know lineages are diverging in these more cryptic phenotypes and that's driving um, lineage divergence. Another possibility is that you know, there's morphological stasis here, perhaps due to parallel selection between these lineages. And so there's an actual, a really interesting theory of mutation order speciation in which parallel selection leads to different mutations being fixed at different times in two lineages. And it's those differences in mutations that actually can lead to isolation. And so perhaps, you know, these lineages are evidence of that. Um, we also think, argue that historical stability is 
very important, especially at least in this system. And that finally, strong reproductive isolation can involve even where you cannot see it. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge some folks. So the first are um, my committee, which also is private. I'll get to them later. Mike <laughs> Ivan, Rosie, and Monty, who um, have been great support and great givers of advice throughout my time here. I'd like to thank the MBZ community. Um, I really didn't, I'll be honest, like when I applied to work with Craig, it was kind of on a whim, and I really didn't know what I was doing. And I think I got so <coughs> lucky to be at Berkeley and to be in this amazing community of scholars and friends. Um, I just, it's, it's been an ideal place to work, and I really appreciate the opportunity I've learned from all of you. And um, my lab, I have a lovely, lovely lab. And I'd like, especially like to point out um, the undergrads with whom I was lucky enough to work, uh, Dan Wade and the Ground Squirrel Group. <laughs> Um, they really asked me questions and made me realize how much I needed to learn and kept me on my toes. Um, my favorite picture of Craig <laughs> during the yoga pose, the down professor. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much about Craig because he's not here, but uh, my fondness for Craig knows a few bounds. He's been just the ultimate um, inspiration and source of support and challenge throughout my time. And of course, there's tons of other people who helped and people who gave money. Um, and with that, I'd love to take any questions. I think this would be a good time to let people who do need to rush out of the room rush out quickly, and then we'll let someone get some questions. Yeah, that works. I just had, I just got my phone to the lab. I just got my phone to Um, yeah, a couple of things. One's like a real harebrained idea. Um, well, maybe I'll say that for what I'm talking to you personally. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. So how about I guess um, the one where you, the genome scan approach? It seems like here you have two areas where you have no kind of ecological difference between these these morphotypes, but that approach seems perfect to compare maybe across a real environmental gradient. And if so, what would you predict then? Like, would you get, like, the DNDS, would, would you expect that to be correlated really um, uh, spatially with, with the environmental gradients? I'm not sure. I, like, so the, I guess what I'm getting at is, like, if, if there's something selecting for one morphotype or one species over the other across yeah. this suture zone, if it, was, if it was associated with some kind of habitat difference, then you would pick up strong signals of selection that would be maybe divergent selection across that. All right. But so here, there's probably no real environmental differences. And so even though you get the same cryptic divergence, so I'm asking, is this a way that you could kind of maybe compare ecological versus non-ecological divergence? So actually, it was interesting because we, one of the reasons we thought this approach would be useful in this system is because there are no obvious phenotypes to pick up on. Um, obviously, we could do more work to collect other phenotypes. Um, that we are like, okay, this is you know using a genome scan where we're kind of agnostic. We just go in and see what's different. That might indicate genes that are doing interesting things, which might reflect some interesting species level differences. Um, and in fact, I didn't talk about this because I'm still analyzing those data. But we did put genes on. We did look at genes particularly that we thought might be interested. So uh, interesting. So genes involved in physiology, um, like an oxfos pathway, and genes involved in like sperm production. Um, that said. So looking at work that's been done similar to this in other systems, you often will identify where there is like a much stronger environmental gradient. You will often identify, like it's obviously a much smaller subset of the genome in which, which is highly differentiated. Yeah. Um, and because it's often there's much more extensive gene flow than is in our system. And in those cases, <coughs> if you look at um, what happens when those loci that are highly differentiated come back into secondary contact, you do see a pattern of decreased integration at those loci. But then again, the pattern isn't as strong as you might think. And so there's, um, you see a correlation, but it's like, 
it's not like a super awesome correlation. <laughs> so it's, it's there though. Um, and so a lot of a lot of this work, there actually haven't been that many papers where they've been able to use geographic lines to look at transitions and what goes on when these contacts come, these um, when you, these low, these divergent loci come back into contact. But there's been some methods using genomic lines that have used this. Um, and I can there's there's some interesting papers. So this is kind of an active, I think, a burgeoning area of research. Yeah, Roy. Well, can, can you go back to the slide where you showed like your your um, the different? Yeah, this that one, that one. So if I understood correctly, so those light blue bars that are the same across the zone, I mean, that's basically a selective sweep of that allele going through. So was there a bias between which one of the parentals gave rise to the selective sweep? I mean, if you looked at those, and, and is there anything about those low side? Yeah, so both great questions, and both of those are things I need to analyze next week. <laughs> so, um, like, I, I kind of might have, like, yeah, I, yeah, so there's a lot of, a lot of the stuff that I've left to analyze with this data set is more locus-specific. Right, genomic, as Craig calls it, genomic natural history. The stuff that's kind of a fishing trip, but you have to do because you have the data. So I want to see if, <laughs> I want to see if there's anything unique going on with these loci. And um, also another thing that I didn't get to talk about, which I think would be really interesting to look at, as I calculated spatial autocorrelation, so a lot of the con loci which I sampled had multiple SNPs in the locus, and you're, you're, I was able to look at how quickly the patterns of climb with changed across the locus. And in the less divergent lineage pairs, there's almost no spatial autocorrelation. So if you have sampled two SNPs within the same locus, and they can be as close as 200 base pairs from each other. They're pretty independent. They're, they're acting pretty independently. And one of the things I'd be interested to know is um, and I hope I can update with you on that a couple, in a couple of days, is, is these loci which have these sweeps, do you see more spatial autocorrelate? Like? So can I ask one more question? Of course. So like if you think about some of the work that's coming out now with like islands of divergence versus yeah. continents of divergence, I mean, one of the ideas is early on if you've got really young tax of diversion, it's more sort of like a continental situation and then these things aggregate into islands over time. Can you test that with your data? No, I think, I don't, I think, it, I mean, it, so the reason there's, no, I can't, and the main reason is because we don't have a genomic scaffold for those data. So, so right? you don't have enough spread, you, you don't know enough about No, the average, you, the so. average size of this, there's two, and the other thing is, that <coughs> argument is much more about, those arguments, um, the theory behind those arguments need a little bit more gene flow between the lineages uh -huh. as they're diverging. And, they do, yeah. and as far as we can tell, there isn't, hasn't been that much gene flow between these lineages as they're diverging. Also, um, yeah, more importantly, we don't have a genome for yeah. these guys. So, like, the closest genome is Anolis. It's 150 million years out. I can assume Syntony, but it seems a bit problematic. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. I have one quick question about this, and then I have a separate question, actually, if I can yeah. ask it. So, just so I understand this correctly, if you go further outside, for, away from your contact zone, these things have different, they have different uh, alleles? Or yeah. is it just the same allele across both speed? No, that's a great question. So this, is, for example, like you were talking about the sweep clients? Yes. So yeah, um, the parental populations are differentially fixed here. Oh, okay. Or not, not necessarily differentially fixed, but I think I said it, you have to be arbitrary sometimes with these things. I think I said it that the allele frequency between the parental populations has to at least be 0 0.7. So like at least 0 0.3 and 1 is 1. And then, but within the contact zone itself, there's no very very little variation in allele frequency. So if you actually ran your your clinal analysis out further, you might find the you know the that there's actually a narrow cline there that happens somewhere else. It's not coincident that's a, with that's this. That's a great question. Yes. It's like possible. what Rob Rumfield found with the color pattern on the Yeah, where like it's it shifts for whatever reason, maybe because there's a difference in demography. Or there's or, the integration of yeah. that is. Yeah, this is yeah. definitely totally possible. Which is this that's actually an interesting point, and I would like that's one of the challenges I've had with this data set is that clines are both conditional on their center and their width. And like thinking about how to analyze both of those at the same time has been actually a little bit challenging because it's intuitive how to handle one or the other. But um, when you have a displaced center, that could also be some evidence of some kind of you know aberrant integration pattern. What I've found though thus far, just by summarizing the data quickly, is that um, most of the things that have a really displaced center tend to have a really, really wide cline. And so I just think like it's just putting the center, you know, like there isn't that much signal in the data. Mm -hmm. It's just putting the center wherever. If it was an offset client, do you think those might be uh, 
individual genes that where you would actually find a relationship with your DMDS ratio? Like if they were in your selection? Maybe. Might be worth, yeah, might be worth Ask another question. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's the same question I asked you after you talked at my lab meeting. Yeah. Maybe you've thought about it and have a, an answer for it. So you, you I don't presented. remember. I was really tired that day. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't, you, you, don't even, you won't remember it. That's true. So, um, so you know, you, you painted this really interesting picture where the age of the divergence is is correlated with the amount of gene flow, like the width of the clines. And it works for four of your five, but it doesn't work for saproscincus, basiliscus, north and central, right? Yeah. So that's, so I'm just gonna say what, go back to what, this one. So what Jim is talking about is this pattern here, which I very conveniently skipped over, um, because it's, it confuses the story a little bit, where the northern lineage has sharply, like has largely intergressed into the southern lineage, the central lineage. And if you look at, and in fact, if you look at the clients, the only reason we knew that we actually had picked up on the client is because I very luckily happened to have one eucalyptus which showed a client there, and then I had the mitochondrial DNA, which, so that made me think that, okay, maybe we picked up on something real. Now, if you look at this at a genomic scale, because now, you know, I was able to look at these data again with more data. You've got the mountain. You've got the mountain to me. <laughs> there, there are mountains, right? Um, uh, there that we go. One. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have about fifty thousand SNPs that are segregating in the in between these two lineages. Um, at about at about like oh, I just wrote about this yesterday. I think I remember. Um, I think at about yeah, at about five yeah, at about five thousand of those, I can fit clients. So most of them are in about. Um, and the rest of the markers, I can't fit clients, and that's because they're showing patterns where you know just there's you know rampant integration in one direction or the other. Um, but there is a small subset of the genome which for which you know I can't fit clients where there's more limited integration. And obviously, it's going to be interesting, kind of going along with what Rory was asking, to understand both the linkage of those and whether or not what whether or not they're um, doing anything interesting in terms of the organism's biology. So it's actually in some it's totally an exception relative to the other ones. Right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, totally. Should be between the green and blue if it's yeah. fitting your model. Yeah. That's why I have for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the key genes, right? Like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you look at all of the symmetry of your clients or so essentially if stuff is moving more in one direction versus yeah, the other? I do. Um, I can just pull that. I have that figure. So So that's this. So this is, um, can you guys, for some reason that seems really hard to see. No, it's fine. It's fine? Okay. All right, so this is for each of the contact zones. This is a distribution of fine centers. And I didn't, is there a better way to measure symmetry? Because I just looked at the skewness of the distribution. So if you guys have a better idea, that'd be great. And you can see definitely for these two contact zones, there's some real asymmetry. Um, and so when I, and there was, you know, when I just saw 10 loci, I saw that asymmetry too, um, which made me think, I was like, oh, I don't know, is this due to selection or is it just due to demography? Being that I see this with so many more loci, I'm more inclined to think that this might be indicative of some kind of demographic processes. Um, but it's hard because, like, I don't know of any good way to model the demography of a client, of clients, like hybrids. I was like, we know we have a really good way of demo modeling demography of two diverging populations, but how do you model, like, Demography in a con yeah. zone. It's something that I think is worth thinking about. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you theory people would like to help, I'm like, okay, yeah. I have a data set. You could you could calculate amount of overlap. So, just like area under a curve, you you took each side and you put them together. So okay. Percent basically just percent overlap. Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah. Because well, I use I use some like measure. Of, Skewness of distribution. Skewness um, is part part of it, but it's not the whole story. It's not is the it? whole thing. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, they are. I mean, they're. I think visually, you can see there's like you know there's a lot of clients whose centers displace this direction. There's a lot of clients whose centers displace this direction. I think a statistical test for skew give you the first approximation. Okay. But yeah, why that is is interesting, and I'm inclined to think it's demography because it's such a big chunk of loci. 
Um, but I mean, mm -hmm. that's just my intuition. I, my intuition's off and off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe just. So I mean, since, since Craig worked in the system for a long time, do you know if the clients or the context are moving at all? Or that's that's a great question. Um, so Craig has been working in this system for a long time, but only one of these hybrid zones is, has been published previously, and oh. that was described. In, it was published in 2006, but they started working on it in 2002. And looking, and that was just um, this contact zone here, Carlia, Carlia, I'm kind of not going to say it. Um, but these, in this contact zone, we have data from about 10 years ago. Yeah. And in 10 years, there hasn't been a shift, which okay. you might predict. But mm -hmm. yeah, good question. So if, if there was a shift, you might, you should have expected to see it maybe 10 years, at least if it's yeah, moving probably. at a decent speed. Yeah, Rosie? So, so it was, you know, I was just thinking, if this is a, uh, uh, <clears throat> on the way to, to generating another new species. Um, I would have thought that if you found organisms that were somewhat more stenotopic, that over their history, over you know, the last whatever million years, these, these, these system, the systems you did place, that <clears throat> you would have had a kind of species pump effect in, the, in, other, in other lineages that were slightly more stenotopic. Do you, do you find that? Yeah, so what the next step is if, the, if, if you assume that this process is going on, and looking at organisms that show, show, show factors that you don't know that would enhance this, this what you see. Yeah, so, I, I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, so you're arguing, you're asking if. Um, could this, like, is this been an important source of biodiversity in other lineages which are more, in which there's more right. room so for more ecologically driven? Right, so if you, yeah, if you extrapolate into the future, you can do that instead by looking at, at groups that are just, that just show these traits a little bit more, um, more acutely, more, you know, that, that, more, um, that they, they show more, more habitat specificity and so that these yeah. barriers are going to be more pronounced. That's an, that's an interesting question. So I'm trying to think. Um, so maybe in the frogs. So look, because the frogs tend to, a lot of these frogs tend to be a little bit. So the species that I study are edge species. So they hang out in the edge of the rainforest. So some of them can hang out in pretty marginal rainforest. Whereas a lot of the frogs in the system are a little bit more restricted to the rainforest. And but the, there's an interesting pattern also in the frogs where a lot of the things that are more recently diverged. Um, also show morphological divergence and divergence in call and divergence in mating behavior. So the frogs seem to be doing, um, I think the frogs are the most natural counterpoint in the system and they're, they seem to be doing something things a little bit differently. I don't know if that's quite. So <clears throat> has the, the system though ended up serving as a, as a species function? Because you know, you're saying here that, that, the, that this is, is heading towards speciation. Yeah, I, I mean, species are, are I think because it's a weird, I mean, I guess it's in some sense, I don't know if this system, like it kind of species pump. Just confusing because right now these, I guess the reason when I'm, I'm getting a little like confused by it, it's like when I think about species pump, I tend to think of like species that are overlapping. And for the most part, these lineages that, you know, these new lineages that we're going to describe, we're, and we're actually are going to put names on some of these guys. Um, they're not, they still are parapatrically distributed, and the area of syntopy is very limited. So beta alpha diversity in the entire region is increasing, but not like geographically, <coughs> alpha diversity isn't, like in a more limited sense. Okay. So your expectation going into the future would be that they all the stay part of the Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, okay, no. Um, that's interesting. So I mean, yeah, if they're, I mean, if they're truly ecologically equivalent, like we're saying, then um, they, that shouldn't happen, right? One of them should go extinct or something should happen first. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they're equivalent, so maybe it is possible for there to be greater overlap in the future. I, tension zones, I don't know how long can, tension zones can be stable <laughs> for the break apart. That's something to think about. <laughs> can I ask a follow-up to that? Yeah. So I know that Carlia is, is a diverse group with a lot of additional species outside of, the, of this area. But is that the case for the others? Because could Saproskinkus and Lampertholus be examples like this, right? Just the older splits that happened in the same system, but now they are sympatric with one another. And we're just looking at the more recent, you know, the recent process as it's continuing. 
Or are these things broadly distributed in New Guinea and whatever? No, so outside? Lamperfolus and Zaphyrskinchus, is all, they're also diverse groups. Lamperfolus actually has an interesting pattern where um, Lamperfolus consists of two major clades, rainforest species and non-rainforest species. And the rainforest species are all quite morphologically conserved and show very little morphological diversification. And the open forest species are quite um, morphologically variable. But even then, there's very few, I don't know of any cases um, in Lamprofolis or Carlia, where any of the species coexist within, like where, there, where there's any syntopy between species within a genus. Right, but the genera occur together. Yeah, and then in Saperskinkus, though, there is co occurrence. <coughs> there's um, Saperskinkus tetradactylus, which co occurs with Basiliscus. Mm -hmm. So, and in that case, though, this, like, it's really different, right? Because tetra tetradactylus is really small um, and it's like very, very small, and basilisk is, of course, quite it's like a more normal-sized lizard, and so they are quite ecologically divergent. But I think, I think a lot of the divergence in this system tends to be the the depth. Oh, that's and I see also the the question you're getting at too. The depth of divergence, like you put the depth of the divergences within these morphologically cryptic lineages in context of the greater species phylogeny. These aren't that much younger than those depths, those breaks between morphologically described species within this complex. So, there, there's not, like, it's not like they're special. They're special, but they're not that special. All right, I'm getting a little more confidence in my harebrained idea now. <laughs> okay. So, kind of follows up on these ideas. So, so, like, what if, I mean, when I was in this system, and I was also a below average uh, collector of this Kagurai <laughs> with, with Craig, um, I didn't get hit by can. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of struck by how similar a lot of the environments were, and, 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 and so today, and maybe in, in the recent history, these environments are really, really similar across, across this context now. But as you were saying, the diversion times are really on the scale of millions of years, right? So in the, in the past, these, div these ancestral species could have been inhabiting extremely divergent environments. And so my harebrained thing is to add another possibility to your list besides stabilizing selection and um, in contact, and that is, what if they used to be morphologically very different, or, or somewhat different, yeah. and now, and then they've experienced directional selection, or convergent selection, basically, to have the same phenotype now, because they're all in the same environment. Hmm. And so, that's kind of a different possibility, but it would be that that means that all that incompatibility would have had to have kind of evolved sort of in the past, because of, there, there used to be this, this conflict of hybridization because phenotypic intermediates might not have been favored in the past, but now it really doesn't matter. But the incompatibility has already evolved because of past divergent selection. That's an inter interesting point. I don't know enough about the history of the wet tropics to know, like, I mean, like, my understanding is that it was, I don't know how far back the pollen data goes to show, like, what the habitat looked like in the past. And I think that would be something that maybe could actually be tested if we knew more about the historical reconstructions. But another point, though, like, that goes along with that, though, is that I didn't put as a hypothesis out there too, which connects to this, is that perhaps they did diverge, there was divergent selection. But like I said, and this kind of gets to Charles' question, the divergence history, like I modeled it very simply just because that's analytically what I could do. Um, but like, it's quite possible that, you know, data suggests that they had repeated opportunity for secondary contact through time and for integration to occur during secondary contact. Mm -hmm. And so, it's quite possible that you know they did diverge, but then during secondary contact and integration, you know you lost that divergence. So integration swept out divergence. I mean, it's possible. That's another. Yeah. I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> you start thinking that, then I don't know. But um, <laughs> I, I think that's interesting to think about, though, like as what was going on in this habitat way, way back when. All right, we have to let someone off the hook now. <laughs> Baker again. No. Excellent. 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 Excellent.